Today's Bible study is about Amos 8. Now, recently we have uh, taken a look at an introduction to the book of Revelation, and then we followed up with a timeline of the book of Revelation about what is really going on with end time prophecies and the order of events. And so I've looked to insert this Amos 8 into the discussion because there are some parallels from Amos, uh, the prophecies of Amos, and the book of Revelation. We'll take a little bit. We're not going to look at a lot of Amos because there's a lot there. We're not going to cover the whole book, but we are, are going to cover a few verses that directly relate to what's happening in the book of Revelation. So if we take a look, first of all, the first question is, is who was the prophet Amos? Well, he was a sheep herder and a sycamore fig farmer. Now, I'm not a big fig eater. Some people like figs. Uh, I do like fig newtons. Uh, <clears throat> that's about as close as I come on that one. I know a little bit about sheep. Uh, uh, when I was a little boy, my dad had a few. And I know that he would fence off the orchard that uh, we had, and they would clean up everything in the orchard. So, uh, and I'm thinking, hey, here we have a... Now, also Amos had to, was a... Uh, uh, was a relatively poor, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, uh, sheep herder, and because he was doing the uh, uh, processing, or the, they say, I guess you have to prick the fruit in order to allow it to expand. So he would be doing that while he was watching his sheep. If you're just sitting watching sheep, it can get pretty boring. So he was uh, making. Uh, uh, making uh, his living as best he could. Amos was one of 12 minor prophets. And we call them minor, not because the prophecies were minor, but because they're relatively small books uh, of those minor prophets. The last 12 books of what we call the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> at the time, of our, uh, the prophet Amos was preaching. He was from the southern kingdom of Judah, but his Preaching was primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. This was at after the division of the kingdom, after uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam took the throne. The, there was a division between the northern and southern tribes. Um, uh, then we know that uh, he lived at the same time as the prophet Hosea and the prophet Isaiah. So we'll have, uh, <clears throat> there'll be some interesting uh, uh, cross-referencing because they were contemporaries at that same time. We also know that Amos, uh, 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 he lived during the, uh, preached during the rule of King Jeroboam II. Of course, Jeroboam I was the breakaway northern kingdom. And he lived during the King Uzziah of Judah, of the, of the southern uh, kingdom. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, Amos preached during a long period of peace and prosperity. When David consolidated uh, 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 under his kingship, he fought a lot of wars. Solomon had a very long and peaceful reign. This was following Solomon's reign, and there was still a lot of peace and prosperity in the land. So if somebody's preaching a warning sign, when everything is just fine, people are going to have a hard time believing. How can this be so? And yet this prophecy was recorded then for our admonition. In fact, a lot of prophecies, they call it dual prophecies for then and then into the future. And some go on into three or more uh, iterations of uh, uh, future events. So let's take a look if we can, uh, <clears throat> why we even have prophecy. In Amos 3.7, the prophet Amos describes it, surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Well, isn't that interesting? What we can say is, there aren't going to be surprises. We've been told, whoever we are uh, in this world. Now, this is because on Amos 3, when we read this, God isn't cruel and uncaring. If he's going to punish a nation, he'll let them know. And why does he let them know? Because they will have an opportunity to repent. Because God is a very fair God. And there are several references to that. I want to take a look at, uh, in Ezekiel 3.17. <clears throat> Ezekiel 3.17. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. So there's saying, hey, they need the warning. Here's a warning. And if we follow up in Ezekiel, 
uh, and we go to Ezekiel 33. Actually, if you read the whole chapter, it really is on point here. But in Ezekiel 33 and verse 17, the children, yet the children of your people say the way of the Lord is not fair. Have you ever heard that? God just isn't fair. Well, well, well. But what does God say through Ezekiel? He said, but it is their way that's not fair. They're not following what God says to do if you want a, a productive and happy life. Verse 18 in Ezekiel 33, 18. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, read sin, he shall die because of it. Verse 19. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. So we have two ways to do right and live, to do wrong, and you earn the consequences of those choices. So the purpose of prophecy, an opportunity to repent. We also read this from the prophet Jeremiah, <clears throat> not long after this period in Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8, was to encourage repentance. Jeremiah 17, uh, 18, verse 7, I, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. Or more realistically, what they're bringing upon themselves, as we've earlier read. You commit the sin, you pay the price. <clears throat> so here we can see when God is, is saying through the prophet Jeremiah, there's a reason or a purpose for the prophecy. And there's a big if. If they repent, we can change the course of history. It won't change the ultimate plan of God but it can change the course of history for those people. Well, now, if we've earlier talked about the book of Revelation, <clears throat> and I want to pull out something here that's uh, 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 in the prophecies of Amos and show how it has a parallel with a point in the book of Revelation. In Amos 8 and verse 9, in fact, we're going to be in Amos 8. You might want to just stick your finger in there or, or a, a tab. It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Well, that's pretty obvious. If the sun goes down at noon. Now, at noon, it does get cloudy. And uh, this did this last week. And when it gets really dark and cloudy, the chickens go into roost, even if it's in the middle of the day. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, Columbus first came to uh, the Western Hemisphere in America, uh, there was an occasion. He was captured by the Taino natives in the Caribbean. And he used his knowledge of astronomy about the upcoming eclipse of the sun. And he said, if you don't let me go, I will black out the sun. And then the eclipse showed up, thankfully, because he knew about it. He was a, uh, a, a remarkable uh, seaman. And and. They respected him. They backed off. Whatever he wants, he gets. Leave him alone. Uh, this guy can command the sun. Uh, uh, which you got to say, if you had no knowledge of that, would be pretty shocking. So here we read, and Amos says, making the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Now, a few years ago, we had a partial eclipse here. And I guess we're going to have another eclipse here in a, other, in a couple of years uh, in Arkansas. And so if you're in the right path, you can get a nice total blackout. It'll, it'll freak out, I know, the uh, animals and the birds. Uh, <clears throat> there's other parts, points of history, I know, that where life has changed with regard to the sun. There's Joshua's long day in Joshua 11, or in Joshua, the book of Joshua in chapter 10, verses 11 to 13, uh, where uh, the day was extended. Okay, well, that had to do, and if, I heard an interesting report on that by an astronomer about how uh, there could have been a, at that time, uh, by his calculation, a comet came near Earth and delayed the rotation of the Earth. So uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky's uh, writings, uh, 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 of course, there's controversy about that, but I thought it was an interesting approach that that would slow the turn of the Earth, which would make a long day. And then there was the uh, uh, some confirmation of that uh, of what's in the Bible, you think, well, how can that possibly be? Well, they had some anthropologists that were studying people in South America, and they came up with, uh, there were all the stories from the South American uh, uh, natives, on the opposite side of the world, uh, from the Middle East, 
that said, we've got these stories about having a long night, the night that just never quit. Well, that would make sense. If there's a long day in one place, you have a long night in any other place. If we take a look in Isaiah 38.8, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> turn to that, but I'm going to refer to King Hezekiah was told, he was at the point of death, and he said, uh, he was told, put your affairs in order. The sun's going to go back 10 steps. I think they calculated 15 minutes or something like that, which would really be a brain bender if all of a sudden all the clocks, or in those times sundials, went backwards. Uh, so we have this when 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 Amos is is saying that uh, <clears throat> that the the sun go down or get dark uh, in the middle of the day. That relates now to Revelation and what we read here in this last month in Revelation sixteen and verse ten of Revelation sixteen ten, and this we talked about the the seven trumpets and then the vials uh, or the bowls. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, meaning of the beast power, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, I had a hard time understanding how darkness could cause uh, a lot of pain, but it certainly would cause a lot of anxiety, mental anguish, if you didn't know what was happening and why it was happening. And you notice this was on the beast's kingdom, in other words, under their power and control. But... <clears throat> This isn't the only time this has ever happened. We've mentioned a few others. If we take a look at history, in Exodus 10, 20, this was one of the plagues over Egypt. And the Israelites, the house of Israel, also experienced that darkness. I had this nice picture here of Charlton Heston. Uh, it was one of the best I could find at that time. It says, stretch out your hand. Uh, uh, what, uh, what God said, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. And interestingly enough, it says a darkness which may even be felt, which means that you probably can't see the hand in front of your face. So this, I'm looking back at Amos, you know, this causing pain, if it can be felt, we know that there's, it's deeply affecting uh, the people there. And the darkness also affected the, uh, uh, the Israelites that were in Egypt at that time. Now we'll go back to Amos. We read Amos 8, 9. Now let's turn to the next verse in Amos 8 and verse 10. I will turn your feasts into mourning, all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it as the mourning of an only son, meaning uh, the following the death of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. So we have this darkness coming about and immediately the next verse said and who is he saying it your feast it doesn't say god's feast it's the sinners of mankind that are being uh, <clears throat> that are bringing the curse upon themselves and the songs in the lamentation there's not going to be a lot of joyful singing when uh, people are uh, are suffering uh, in such a way uh, so uh, if we take a look then at uh, also uh, earlier in Amos, in Amos 5.21, uh, God says through Amos, I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. And we see a lot of those nowadays. They're irreligious, or at least not in God's religion, uh, and they're having their own celebrations. And these are the feasts that will be turned into mourning the people's pagan feast days, what they celebrate. Uh, so it follows in this same theme that we're reading from uh, the book of Revelation in Revelation 16.10. Now, if we take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, we can read the letter to the Th uh, Thessalonians, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, we're looking here at people who left sin, joined the truth, the truth of the living and true God, in other words, abandoning uh, what God didn't like and join themselves to what God wants, and what happens to them? 
they will be delivered from the wrath to come. So this should be encouraging for those who follow God, follow the truth, being delivered. And that means even in this darkness. And we're going to get into that here in a moment. We're in Amos. Uh, now let's go to Amos 8 and verse 11. In Amos 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst of water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Now, this is interesting because there are famines where people are doing without food, uh, doing without water throughout history. Uh, in fact, we have a, a lot of uh, recordations of this famine and famines. Uh, in fact, I looked, uh, there are 95 references to famine in the New King James Version of the Bible. And we read a lot of those, you know, just Abraham uh, or Abram then went to Egypt. Here later, his son Isaac uh, uh, left the land because of a famine. Joseph was uh, interpreted the dreams on how to, and then was tasked with preparing Egypt for seven years uh, of famine. During that time, Jacob uh, had uh, experienced the famine, took his family or his family went to Egypt to buy grain and ultimately moved there. So we've got <clears throat> plenty of examples in the Bible. There were three years of famine during King David's reign. When Elijah was the prophet uh, in Samaria under King Ahab, uh, he said he prayed for no rain. For three and a half years, there was no rain. That will certainly cause a famine. You, How many of us have three and a half years stored up of food? And even if you get caught in the middle of the year and you couldn't grow anything, you've still got the rest of the year to do it. So the famine extended for quite some time. The time of Elisha, we have the record, a recorded famine. We've mentioned the time of King Hezekiah. Uh, there was a famine. The famine was prophesied by Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. In fact, we're told that a third of mankind will die uh, uh, from that uh, circumstance uh, in Ezekiel. Jesus Christ referred to <clears throat> future famines in Matthew 24, verse 7. In Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation will rise against nation and the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And indeed, we see in our small little lifetimes compared to the history of man, we've seen, not fully experienced, but we are aware of famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Uh, I remember this had to be about 1980-ish or so. There, there was a nasty uh, earthquake uh, in in Armenia. And I remember three weeks later, they were still digging people out who had survived three weeks trapped underneath that. I remember I had, I had, a, I tripped and fell in our, in our business at that time. I was locking up, uh, it was late on a, late on a Friday afternoon. We're closing early and I tripped and fell. I had just shut the lights off and I was taking a shortcut through the warehouse. And I remember falling right in front of the door and it was just a light a little light a uh, crack of light under the door but the serviceman's radio was playing on the other side of the door nobody would know where i was they were all it's about 4 30 they were all ready to go home and i thought if he leaves his radio on all weekend i can't move i'm here on the floor and i could look under the door to see under the crack on the door and, I, and my thought was i'm wondering is this what the people were like in Armenia in the earthquake where they're trapped? They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. And so when you get that little experience, and there I am lying on the floor uh, uh, in a bad way. Eventually, obviously, I learned to walk again. Uh, but it took a while. Uh, I, did, I did get patched up, and eventually they heard me scratching on the door. Uh, uh, to, to all. But I do, uh, and it brought it to life about... Uh, 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 about earthquakes and such. So when I read these kinds of verses, you're going, that's happened throughout, uh, throughout history. Many of the famines throughout history are man-made. We know of uh, the Irish potato famine <clears throat> in the 1800s. Uh, interestingly enough, and there were a huge number, over a million people actually 
in the next 30 years, uh, there were about 2 million Irish that came and left the country. About a million during this five-year period uh, uh, left the country. About a million people died. Interestingly enough, potatoes are not native to Ireland. They're a Western Hemisphere uh, root, uh, root crop, uh, root vegetable. Yet they became in the 1800s was absolutely essential. What a lot of people don't know is that Ireland also exported food during this famine when they were dying because most of the Irish didn't own the property. The landlords from uh, Great Britain did and the Irish were basically their uh, slaves and they extracted their portion first and the Irish could live on whatever was left. So Ireland was actually, it was a man-made famine to a large degree. Now there was a potato blight, you know, there was a, a low crop, but the people uh, uh, were in a bad way because it, the rent came first and then whatever was left you had to live on. The people, it was terrible. They, they dug, they had no place to live. Uh, many of them couldn't pay the rent. Uh, and so they, it was just a, a terrible tragedy that, that, that lingers on through uh, American history now. But it's not the only uh, major uh, man-made famine. We have that one in, when the Soviet dictator uh, Stalin uh, starved the Ukrainians, deliberately so. Interestingly enough, similarly, uh, it's the breadbasket uh, of Europe, Ukraine, and so he just took food, what they had, and shipped it to uh, uh, wherever else he wanted to put it in the uh, Soviet Union. Killed about 5 million Ukrainians. That's more than the people in Arkansas and Missouri and a couple other states uh, added together uh, at that time. So man-made famines, not uncommon. I've, I've started making a list of others. You have Pol Pot in Cambodia where he forced people out of the cities and you have millions of people have died there. Uh, so most of those famines are man-made. So let's take now a look at this famine of the hearing of the words. In Amos 11, uh, <clears throat> it said, we have a famine, not of bread or water, although those will occur. This is not what he's talking about, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. Notice it does not, what it does not say. It does not say a famine of the word of the Lord. It's a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord doesn't say a famine of the preaching, just that if there's nobody there to hear. Sort of like if the tree falls in the forest and no one is there, does it still make a sound? Well, if we take a look at the world we live in now, all of a sudden this might make a little more sense because we now have censorship of our major media in a way that we haven't really experienced in the United States before. Now they have in other countries of the world where the government controls the media, uh, and and it's the official government line, whether it's China or any other uh, authoritarian country. And so now we have newspapers, radio stations, uh, um, oh, I put it twice, should be television stations, magazines and book publishers. And if you take a look at the numbers, <clears throat> 1,500 newspapers, 9,000 radio stations, 1,500 TV stations, and 1,100 magazines and 2,400 book publishers, all owned by six owners. Six corporations own them. So how do you throttle or, or limit the distribution of the news or to channel it in whatever people want to say is simply by controlling uh, or the people that control those six corporations, not even the stockholders. Uh, they usually find out about it later. So you have now this, we are living now in a world of major censorship. It's affected the church in that we no longer have the same broadcast of the Beyond Today program. It's been scattered. Now, fortunately, we do have it in this area, but it's one of those areas. We, we uh, no longer have that on some of the major uh, uh, platforms that we used to have. Um, the same thing is true with social media. You may be familiar with all the uh, uh, all the news lately about Twitter. I, I don't. I'm not on Twitter, but I'm, I'm well aware of, of the uh, uh, of the news about it. But you also have other big social media that uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, and and Apple 
And because of their centralized control, you have a pushback. And so now you have other companies that are saying, wait a minute. Uh, and, and, uh, and so we have the other social media and other search engines coming to fore and saying, we, we, don't, we aren't going along with the centralized control and censorship. Uh, in fact, we've also uh, adopted that here, is, pro, is, is posting our messages on a variety of other places other than Facebook or YouTube because of the level of control, not only that they're affecting now, but they could as well into the future because we see what they're doing with other places. So you have other places where so far, but <clears throat> if we go back here and take a look at this famine of the hearing of the word in Amos 11, 8, 11, what's going to happen when people want to hear the truth, they're sure it's out there somewhere. And we just go to the next verse. And what does it tell us in Amos 8 and verse 12? They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, doing what? Seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. They're restrained or restricted from finding out about the truth they were uh, like the uh, uh, like the bridesmaids didn't have oil in the lamp, and now they're seeking it. They're looking everywhere for it, and it's hard to find. Uh, and so, and it says, "Shall not find it." Well, then we ask ourselves, "Well, what can we do?" Well, what we can do is we can build our own library, both hard copy and electronic. Why both? Well. What happens if we have a burp or a hiccup in our electronic world? We may or may not be able to have uh, uh, the truth and the details of it. Uh, this, uh, so a hard copy is also in order. And then build up our personal knowledge of the truth. I remember as a young man, my dad said, son, get your education because they can't take it away from you. Once you've learned something, that becomes part of you. It's ingrained in you. You know it. And the reason we look at that is uh, in 1 Peter 3.15, we, uh, we are advised, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So if people are running to and fro, they don't have a source. Where are they going to find it? Says they shall not find it. But what if you're there? Are you going to be the one that that uh, is available when those people are desperately looking for the word of truth? And then we individually must be prepared to give a defense, meaning of what we believe and how we believe it, of the hope that is within it. And you notice this word hope. It doesn't say well, we're going to have the uh, dismal days coming, woe is us, and then we all die, the end. No, it doesn't say that. It says of the hope that is within you, because we understand the plan of God. We understand that there is a great hope and an expectation that God keeps his word and will ultimately deliver that. So I wanted to bring this awareness of the famine of the hearing of the word that we're experiencing in part now but we know that it's going to become more uh, dramatic uh, as time goes on so that we can be fully uh, prepared and also understand how this is parallel with what we read about the bowls of the vials being poured out in the book of Revelation.